everybody. I'm coming to you live from Drug Discovery Chemistry in San Diego. It's bright and sunny outside, but what's made it more warm and fuzzy is having two-time Nobel laureate Dr. Barry Sharpless here with us. So he won his first Nobel Prize in 2001 for his chiral-focused oxidation, and again in 2022 for click chemistry. So I am super thrilled to be sitting at the same table with him. Thank you so much for taking the time for joining us. My first question is, what is why click chemistry? Where did that word come from? It looks like you coined the term click. Uh, my wife named it, and she's a very smart person. She's an English major, a linguist, and a writer. But she, uh, language is just really easy. For, you know, I, I was going to call it neat chemistry because, you know, in, in, in places. My Ireland, England, they drink their whiskey neat. You have to be a real man to do that. <laughs> but no, it, neat wasn't going to work because it, it also means, in our country, sort of cute, cute, yeah. And so, but click chemistry, because basically it's like your seat belt. You, you got to get this thing on. You don't want to be creative. You just got to get this reaction. It's got to go. And so any reaction that, that can't not go that has to go, if it's per it'll be a perfect reaction if it has no escape hatch. In other words, if there's no side reaction or anything. Anyway, we never thought about perfect reactions. We thought good reactions, but 96, 98, 99%. If you go 10 steps, you're already down to 90 some percent. But if you, if you have 99.9995 plus, you, you can go a thousand steps and still have 97% yield. It's the power, you put the yield, average yield in the, inside and you raise it to the power of the steps. It's pretty bloody awful because if it's a low, if the number gets a little bit low, it starts to grow really fast, right? Compared to what it is when it's almost nothing. You square nothing, you keep getting nothing for a long time, you know? That's, it's, that, it's that easy to see that and then if you had those kind of reactions, you could do so much. You could predict things. You could, you'd be in a different world. So, but admittedly, you can't have them all the time. And nature can't have them. You wouldn't look to nature for reactions like that because she needs to take things apart. Most of the ways you look at nature, you see all these things she does. But one of the bottom lines is she has to reuse a, a lot of the pieces. If she doesn't get to do that, we could have been history a long time ago, you know. So is that what made you think of the chemistry? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think that nature, you know, all of us are nature, and sometimes the best we can do is metaphors about nature and chemistry. But so, so uh, the fact is we can't do chemistry. I mean, it, we call it chemistry, so it is chemistry. But mm -hmm. we aren't, uh, the, the universe in the condensed matter area of the universe, like, every place we can see in those telescopes, they have molecules that bump into each other. And so chemistry can happen, right? What happens out there in the plasma, now that ain't the same at all, right? And yet all that happens with those atoms when they come down and condense into, into a condensed area of the universe, they recover their electrons. Where were those electrons? They didn't come from anywhere. They materialized. Feynman told his father this, Richard Feynman. His father said, I've spent so much time teaching you as a kid. He taught him about birds in the forest. And, and there were so many birds. And he, he wouldn't name any of the birds. He would, he would say, there's, there's an interesting bird. And he'd say everything about what the bird was doing. Everything. And, and, and oh, and then he... he so he got an award, his father got an award for, the, for being the most best teacher. And other fathers said, well, the wife said, hey, there are birds out there. Why don't you take your son out and your daughter out and teach him about birds? So can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? And if you were not a chemist, what else would you well, have? I got my education. And it was the Manasquan River estuary. I went there in the summer. My mother was from Manasquan. And she was from Norwegian fishing family. So. So I had automatically interested in ocean and fishing, and and uh, and also I was only I guess when I was six years old, my parents gave me a rowboat 
with, with an outboard motor on it, an Elgin, two and a half horsepower. And the only thing they didn't want me to do was go in the ocean because, you know, it can't. But of course, I did do that. But, but that, then I started going everywhere in the river and almost doing dredging. You're trying to find out what everything was in the mud or whatever. And then I got working on, on making soft shell crab, catching soft shell crabs. And, but then I got on the fishing boats for, and, and charter boats for go out. And that was where I really got freedom because I went out to the open ocean every day. Just that morning at sunrise, the boats going out the inlet, putting the outriggers down. We got a bunch of people I've got to take care of, but but that's no problem because we were fishing all day. And, and you know, that was an area where I didn't get much ideas from, but what I really got from the river was a sense of evolution, a sense of life and how ridiculous it was, you know. And, and, and sealing that, God, wait, how the, is this thing alive or not? Sometimes when you get into the mud and you get this creature, you know, it's slimy and it's suspicious looking, but how do you know when something's alive or dead? You know? So I heard that you would have gone to med school had it not been for a teacher who recommended that you do chemistry, is that correct? Yeah, Tom Spencer at Dartmouth, very wonderful man, brilliant guy, great teacher. And I got in trouble with him right away the first, uh, first year because I got invited to be in a senior graduate course. And, and I was right next to where he was talking at the blackboard. And I was taking notes in a big notebook. And I was writing <laughs> noisily and large. And I, then I realized later when I saw his, notebook, his lab notebook, it was teensy, it, like the Chinese could write. You know, it was really teensy and perfect. And he, we had an understanding that we were, that he, thought I was a good chemist, but, but the business of style is, is kind of, and I stopped doing that. I, I, I still regress to large writing when I can. <laughs> it's a different way that people are getting information these days, different ways in which they are doing things. What would your advice be to young chemists out there? Well, I think uh, you got, if you're not interested in something, it's hard to be really keen on anything you're not interested in. And, so the interest is really, and sometimes it doesn't make the parents happy, but, but uh, the interest really uh, turns the mind on, right? And, and then you lay awake at night thinking about things, and yeah, you're, you're not bored. I, the trouble is the curiosity, it's about curiosity, right? And this woman who was a great writer and, and columnist back 40 years ago in New York, uh, I can't remember her name right now, but she said, it's about curiosity. It's such an important thing. It's much more interesting than almost anything. And, but, and so therefore, it's really good to have it. But if you have curiosity, there's no cure for curiosity. There's cure for other things. Oh, curiosity is a cure for the other thing. Okay, that's it. And then, but there's no cure for curiosity. <laughs> It's a real pleasure to have Dr. Barry Sharpless with us. I don't know if he can top it off <laughs> for our next keynote, but thank you again for joining us in San Diego. You've really made this event truly historic. Thank you.